Hello everyone. Today's video is going to be a little different from our usual affair in that we're not going to be doing any kind of media analysis. Instead, I'd like to just take some time to talk about a historical figure who interests and fascinates me. And I'd like to begin by proposing a question. What do you think of when you think of pirates? I mean, you probably think of people like Blackbeard, Henry Morgan, or Captain Kidd, and that's understandable. There exists a specific image of pirates and pirate life in modern culture. The popular image of swashbuckling scoundrels who use yo-ho-ho -ho and a bottle of rum as a battle cry has little relevance in actual history, and it's also limiting in both scope and location. Piracy in the Caribbean pales in comparison to piracy in East Asia, and the largest pirate force in history was not the Brotherhood of the Coast, but was in fact the Guangdong Confederation, consisting of over 500 ships, and 70,000 pirates. Perhaps even more remarkable is that this pirate coalition was led by a woman named Zhang Yi Sao, which translates to the wife of Zhang Yi, which we will get to later. One of the peculiarities of Zhang Yi Sao's pirate fleet is that she issued a rigorous code of laws that all pirates under her command were required to follow. The result was that the pirates under her command led strange lives of both rigorous, almost militaristic discipline, and typical piratical chaos. Now, it's typical to expect those drawn to piracy to be people that have been failed by conventional society. Farmers who didn't receive government support when a drought hit, soldiers who weren't paid for their service, coastal fishers that were banned from their source of revenue, or women who were sold into slavery as sex workers as children. Philip Mahan, who was held captive by Zhang Yi Sao's pirates in 1809, said that those who joined the pirates, quote, had been oppressed by the mainland Chinese government and society, and probably had lost everything they possessed, end quote. These, and others like them, are going to be the people most likely to join a pirate band and help create a new, separate society. By becoming a pirate, a person must force themselves to live outside society, because if they returned, they would be arrested or executed. To function in a group, however, it is necessary to create a new organization and a hierarchy. In essence, a new society. Sociologist Joseph McKay refers to this as the creation of escape societies. The early and scattered pirate groups that would later become the Guangdong Confederation consisted mainly of coastal people, fishers and traders, whose livelihoods were often so miserable that, for many, a successful pirate foray was the sole hope for a better life. Zhang Yixiao herself was likely sold into prostitution and lived in that capacity until she was captured by pirates under the command of Zhang Yi. When she married her captor and took over the administration of the Confederation, she helped create this new escape society. The pirates of the Guangdong Confederation lived odd lives of two halves. The first half, the piratical one, was violent and seemingly chaotic. It led to disrepair and chaos above the decks of pirate chunks. One European captive recalled a pirate ship sailing into battle while on deck, a group of pirates sat playing cards. When a cannonball arced above the side of the gunwale and killed one of the card players, the rest of the group simply dragged his body off and resumed the game. The people of the Confederation were violent and made their fortunes by stealing from, kidnapping, extorting, and killing traitors and villagers. Whatever else they were, they were certainly pirates. Philip Mahan described them as, quote, the worst characters in China, such as outlaws, gamblers, and villains of every description, end quote. Primary accounts are filled with references to the Confederation's violent plunder of coastal villages. As much as their new pirate societies were separate from mainland life, they still fed off of traditional society. Their ships, the ubiquitous junks, were a reflection of this chaotic pirate life, at least above the water. Mahan described the ships themselves as, quote, rudely constructed above the water's edge, end quote, and said that the hull offered trifling resistance to shot. Discipline aboard ship was apparently lax. Richard Glasspool, another European captive, claims that the pirates were, quote, extremely careless of their ammunition, keeping it in chest above deck and smoking while sitting upon them, end quote. While this may have been the norm for Guangdong ships, there were very likely exceptions. Different captains and commanders likely maintained different levels of discipline aboard their ships, and the ships most likely to take European captains may have been the rudest looking ones, causing the Westerners to underestimate the pirates. In any case, it seems that these ships were fairly chaotic micro-societies, the kind that would be expected of pirate vessels. However, what makes the Guangdong Confederation under Zhang Yi Sao especially interesting is in the ways that pirate life subverted these expectations. In many ways, the Guangdong Confederation was highly legalistic and organized, in a way that is more analogous to a modern navy than a loose group of pirate fleets. While Zhang Yi Sao's later code of laws are an essential aspect of Guangdong pirates, 
the earlier Pact of 1805, when Zheng Yi was still alive, is an important foundation of what came later. The Pirate Pact of 1805 was a turning point for East Asian piracy. After the collapse of the Taishan dynasty in Vietnam, former privateers turned pirates and anarchy ruled the waves as the different pirate groups frequently fought each other. The leaders of these fleets, each desiring an end to the conflict, met in Guangdong and signed a pact which would bind each fleet to a strict code of rules. It is this meeting that gives the Guangdong Confederation its name. The code the chieftains came up with is remarkable in both its rules and punishments. The rules put in place sound remarkably out of place for pirates. They mandated that each branch, created out of the disparate pirate fleets, have their own banner, flag, and number. Each ship would be required to display their number and fly their flag so that everyone knows which fleet the ship belongs to. In addition, each vessel had its own unique registration number that was painted on its bow. This level of organization and policymaking is unexpected in a world of pirates. For there to be registration numbers, there must necessarily be a registrar, someone whose job it is to keep track of ship registration. And because the confederation was split into several fleets, there were likely a fair few registrars in the Guangdong Confederation. This heavily contrasts with our traditional ideas of pirates. We imagine tales of sword fights and daring do, not organizing records by candlelight. The idea of an organized bureaucracy existing in a pirate fleet is shocking. A key element to the success and adoption of the Pact of 1805 was that many of the pirates used to be legal privateers working for the Taishans in Vietnam. Zheng Yi's cousin, Zheng Qi, was master of the stables in Vietnam and was appointed by the last Taishan king. Many leaders of the disparate pirate fleets often held positions in the Taishan court, and it is likely that they were used to official organization. That familiarity would have made it simpler for them to accept and implement policy that, though it limited their individual authority, made the group as a whole stronger. The punishment for violating the policies of the pact were especially piratical, however. Should a ship be found flying the wrong flag or with the wrong registration number, its captain would be executed by beheading. Pirates make their living using violence. If a hammer thinks that everything is a nail, then a pirate is going to solve all their problems through violence. This high level of organization, combined with brutal violence, is emblematic of the split lives that the Guangdong Confederation pirates lived. The other provisions of the Pact of 1805 mainly had to do with the general conduct of vessels in the Confederation and punishments for violating the terms, typically death. The seventh provision, however, is especially interesting and points to the growing unity among the pirates of the South China Sea. Quote, If there are merchants on either land or sea who have been the enemies of any one of us, and who dare not hide themselves but continue to openly do business with us, we must restrain our personal anger for the good of the entire group. We cannot use our power as a pretext to harm them on the grounds that they are our enemies, or implicate their kith and kin as an excuse to kidnap them. Once such violations are discovered, they will be punished for false implication. End quote. The line here that's especially shocking is, we cannot use our power as a pretext to harm them. After all, using power as a pretext to harm is the entire justification of piracy. Yet these pirates agreed to join together and forgive past slights against themselves for the good of the entire group. This willingness to set aside grievances for the benefit of others in the group shows how seriously the Guangdong Confederation were treating this new coalition. While perhaps not as united as they would eventually become, the signing of the pact marks the shift from a collection of disparate fleets to a single pirate force under one commander. It's hard to say exactly what Zheng Yi Xiao's role in crafting the Pact of 1805 is. We know that she had been married to Zheng Yi for some time and had already taken a role in managing the financial and administrative aspects of his fleet. She was the mind behind Zheng Yi's sword and made sure that his fleet ran smoothly despite its rapidly growing size. It is likely that Zheng Yi would have shown deference to his wife in matters of administration, after all, he's the one who appointed her and her intellect was a key factor in his rise to power. Zheng Yixiang was not a direct signatory of the Pact of 1805, but her ideas were likely on the page. We can tell this since her later code of laws that she wrote once she took power reflects the Pact of 1805 with some key differences. Unfortunately, however, since pirates do not typically keep minutes of their meetings, we don't know exactly what was said at the conference. We don't know what policies and punishments that Zheng Yi introduced. Certain similarities, such as the frequent prescription of death with Zheng Yixiao's later code of laws, points towards her having at least a partial influence on the text of the pact. Ultimately, this is simply speculation based on limited evidence, as is unfortunately the case with much surrounding Zheng Yixiao. While significant and the founding document of the group, the Pact of 1805 was not the single most important code of laws for the Guangdong Confederation. 
Zheng Yi died in a storm in 1807, and his wife made a well-timed bid for power. She became the new ruler of the Guangdong Confederation, and cemented her power by marrying her adopted son, Zheng Bao, we don't want to get into it, and appointing him head to the Red Flag Fleet, the strongest in the Confederation. In order to secure her authority as leader, Zheng Yisao instituted a new code of laws building on and expanding the Pact of 1805. One of the key improvements that this new code made over the Pact of 1805 was that it regulated shipboard discipline throughout the entire fleet. The effect of this was twofold. First, it meant that lazy or sloppy captains could no longer get away with not instilling discipline in their ships, bringing the entire fleet closer together in quality. Second, by making it so that discipline and authority came from a higher code of laws rather than a specific captain, Zheng Yisao made it so that the crews were more directly loyal to her rather than their respective commanders and captains. Considering that captives in 1809, two years after this code became law, considered many of the pirate ships to be chaotic even with these reforms, there must have been serious lack of discipline throughout the entire fleet beforehand. By regulating her new fleet in this way, Zheng Yisao helped ensure that her pirate force would be the most powerful force in the South China Sea. Another key provision of Zheng Yisao's code was the formalization of the distribution of plunder and wealth. Whenever a ship or squadron took a prize, that force got to keep 20% of the plunder as a bonus. The remaining 80% would become part of the common fund and used for the maintenance and resupply of the entire fleet. This rule managed to balance incentivizing pirates to take loot, while also ensuring enough supplies for the entire fleet existed. The effect of this was that even unsuccessful ships were well supplied, and vessels in the Guangdong Confederation were always able to bring their full force to bear without having to worry about conserving ammunition. In a fleet of over 500 ships and 70,000 pirates, Zheng Yisao managed to find a way to keep all of her ships armed and all her pirates fed. Such a logistical achievement, especially in the year 1807, illustrates how accomplished the Guangdong Confederation was at taking prizes, as well as the sheer administrative intellect of Zheng Yisao herself. To a sailor, especially a pirate, in the early 19th century, knowing that they had food and fresh water for the next few weeks provided the confidence and security needed to sail into danger. In addition to the distribution of wealth and plunder, the pirates of the Guangdong Confederation made it a point to purchase necessary supplies from local fishers and villagers. According to Jay Turner, who spent a number of months with the Guangdong pirates, they paid, quote, honorably for these supplies. This seems to point to yet another odd binary in pirate life. One would expect pirates to simply take what they wanted from defenseless fishermen, and certainly they did raid fishing villages all the time, but they also maintained safe ports of call and had several villages that they treated with honor, as Turner puts it. It's a sensible strategic decision, but still one that's unexpected from pirates. Perhaps the most significant policies where shipboard life was concerned were the policies about sex. Pirates, being a people naturally predisposed towards violence of all sorts, frequently partook in essay and kidnapping. Zheng Yisao herself came into piracy by being kidnapped from a floating brothel in Canton. Her new code made essay a crime and prescribed the usual punishment, death by beheading. While it is impossible to truly determine how much this specific rule was followed, several primary accounts describe an execution for S.A. The pirates, however, were allowed to take spouses, but they could only take one, and they were required to remain faithful to them. Infidelity was punished by beheading. Since the pirates had no permanent stronghold on shore, they lived with their families aboard ship. In addition, should a pirate choose to take a spouse, the new couple would be given their own private cabin at the stern of the ship a small accommodation, but still more space than they had otherwise. Now, I use non-gendered pronouns when discussing the pirates taking spouses because many of the pirates were women, some of whom were captains of their own ships. Considering that the confederation was led by a woman, this is perhaps unsurprising, but it is remarkable nonetheless. Women were commonly viewed with superstition by sailors of this time, so to have them not only aboard ship, but fighting and commanding as well, it points to a certain level of egalitarianism in the Guangdong Confederation. Certainly, the pirates were hierarchical, with a power structure mirroring that of a military, but it seems that anyone was able to occupy any place within that hierarchy. Now, with these legal codes and consequences, it is possible to create a rough sketch of pirate life in the Guangdong Confederation. The typical unmarried pirate would sleep in a large common room at the bow of the ship. While this area was large, there were so many pirates that free space was at a premium. 
Each person would receive only about four square feet in which to sleep. Married pirates could keep their whole families aboard ship in a small cabin provided to them. They would wake up, take care of their duties, be it uh, trim the sails, clean the guns, work the ropes. Most of the day, though, they would be given over to free time and general idleness. Life at sea, even for a pirate, was mostly boring routine, occasionally broken up by moments of intense danger. These pirates were apparently fans of gambling and playing cards, which is how they spent most of their free time. By all accounts, when they did engage in battle, the pirates of the Guangdong Confederation were both determined and vicious. Glasspool characterized them as, quote, In their attacks they are intrepid, and in their defense most desperate, yielding in the latter instance to no superiority of numbers. They are taught to be fearless in danger, end quote. Battle at sea in the Age of Sail was an arbitrary, dangerous thing. Splinters a foot and a half long could embed themselves in a person's arm, necessitating amputation. A wooden hull did little to impede the flight of a cannonball, and a shot could easily remove limbs, cripple cannons, or even detonate the magazine. In the small confines of a ship, officers and commanders were subject to just the same danger as the rest of the crew. All on board the ship were forced to put themselves in harm's way in order to bring their weapons to bear. In the event that the ship was boarded and the fighting became hand-to-hand, -hand, there was no swashbuckling that was popularized by the likes of Harold Flynn. Fighting was vicious, and weapons were often improvised. The Guangdong pirates armed themselves with anything they could get their hands on, but they did have some preferred weapons. They favored short, curved swords and spears made out of bamboo. The short swords provided flexibility in the confines of a ship, and the spear was useful for repelling boarders. After the ship was taken and the plunder allotted out, the ship that captured the loot would get to keep 20% divided amongst the crew, with the rest being sent to a central distribution location. If the ship captured was of sufficient quality, it could even be added to the pirate fleet. And then, now slightly richer, the pirates would set sail again, back on the hunt and looking for their next prize. So what are we to make of all of this, right? How can we conceptualize Zhang Yi Sao's Guangdong Confederation? Were they just a group of bandits? Were they a mafia organization? Were they even a country? On the scale of Sealand to New Zealand, where do they fit? Because if we're happy to say that they were just pirates, then they were radically different from any pirates before or after them. They did all the things that nations do. They passed laws, they punished crimes, charged terrorists, taxes, and tolls. They had a bureaucracy and regulated the military. They signed treaties with other countries. They had a flag. If there's a middle ground between an oil platform and an actual country, where does this confederation fall? And if we conceptualize it as a state, what does it say about the world that somebody with a lot of money, intelligence, and guns could just make a country, even a short-lived one? I don't know, but it does compel me all the same. Zheng Yi Sao defied all conventions. She was a respected female ruler in an age where women were treated with contempt. She lived a life on the sea incomprehensible to most people. When her husband died, she did not take on the expected role of the chaste widow instead choosing to seize power for herself. Her laws created a weird dual lifestyle of piratical chaos and military rigor. She turned a large disjointed group of pirates into a disciplined fleet of crack soldiers that for a decade terrorized the South China Sea. And she managed to retire peacefully when other pirate leaders almost universally met violent bloody ends. She cut a deal with the Chinese government and retired on land where she would run a gambling house for the rest of her life. She lived to be 70 years old. When she made her deal, she was sure to guarantee full pardons for all the pirates under her command as well. Her crews, made up of fishers and villagers turned pirate, could once again return to peaceful civilian life and live behind the odd dual lives of pirates in Zhang Yi Sao's fleet. Hey, thanks for watching all the way to the end. I really appreciate it. This is kind of a weirder video to me. I'm trying out a new style where it's just more like a history lesson. Uh, leave a comment down below what you thought and uh, how you want to conceptualize Zhang Yi Sao's fleet. I'm really looking forward to reading everybody's responses. Uh, be sure to like, subscribe, and do all the YouTube things before you head out. And yeah, have a good one.